1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18. About uh, a week and a half ago in the morning service, I preached a message on the marks of a true friend. The marks of a true friend. Anybody remember that message? The marks of a true friend. We were in 1 Samuel 19. Uh, we said that a true friend will always tell you the truth. A true friend always tells you the truth. Uh, we said a true friend, a true friend strives to be a peacemaker. And in those first two points, we saw that in the life of Jonathan, Jonathan's friendship with David. And then we looked at David's relationship with his marriage with his wife, Michael, and we saw that a true friend is always there in time of need. A true friend is always there in time of of need, and we saw how she helped David, and we also reiterated that your spouse should be your best friend. And then we saw David on the run, and he goes to Samuel the prophet, and we saw that a true friend provides a spiritual refuge, a spiritual refuge. Well, I took this message, and uh, last, towards the end of last week, the first part of this week, I did, uh, I preached this to our high school, our 7th through 11th grade, and went over those points with them. Well, as I went over that, there's a lot of things about friendship that didn't come. And there's some other things I'm going to show you tonight. So tonight I have a message entitled, Soul Brother. Soul Brother. And uh, there's no chicken with that. It's a soul brother. Amen. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 8. You can laugh. 1 Samuel 18. All right. Uh, there's no doubt as we're studying the life of David, David, uh, his, uh, his life is one adventure after another. It's one role after another. In chapter 16, we find David as a shepherd, uh, and he's also a singer, a player of the heart. We see in chapter 17, David is a soldier. He kills the giant Goliath. In chapter 18, we find David's on the run. He's the salt one. And uh, his life is about to take a drastic change in direction. Because in chapter 16, he's anointed. He goes from being the shepherd of the flocks to being the anointed king, next king of Israel. In chapter 17, David goes from delivering uh, food and supplies to his family to delivering the nation of Israel from the giant Goliath and the nation of the Philistines. And as you look at his life so far in David's life, everything has been going pretty well. Uh, but as you and I know, there are new challenges and dangers and trials and victories uh, lying on the horizon for him. In the midst of these trials, in the midst of these difficult circumstances that David is about to go through, God gives David something worth its weight in gold. He gives him, as they might say, now if I'm wrong on this, it's okay, but in the 1970s, they would say soul brother. In the 1980s, they'd say maybe a best friend was a kindred spirit. The 1990s, maybe a soulmate. I don't, I don't know what the term is today. Uh, what is it? BFF, a BFF, there's one for you. Uh, maybe they're part of the squad or the posse. they got different things to about friendship. So I'll talk about friends again tonight. And, and, and really, you know, we live in a day and age where everybody's on the phone. There's a lot of this going on. And, and but we, there, there's some great biblical principles about friendship. And, and not only about what type of friend should you have, but what type of friend you should be. And so we looked at that a week and a half ago, the four marks of a, the marks of a true friend. But I want to come back and, and, and we'll hit some of that again, but add new stuff to us, some stuff that I didn't cover in the first message, but in teaching the teenagers came to light. And so we'll give that to you tonight. And hopefully it will be helpful to you. So let's pray, and then we'll come back and, and look at 1 Samuel 18. Lord, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here tonight. And thank you for what we've enjoyed just by way of fellowship. And, uh, Lord, uh, sharing a few laughs and be able to sing songs into you in prayer time. We've come to hear from you, and I pray tonight as we uh, take this teaching time, Lord, to again hit something that's very important in our life, friends. Friendship, being friendly, being the right type of friend, having the right type of friend. So I'm supposed to see this in Scripture tonight. You just need to pray. Amen. And so the friendship of Jonathan and David. Look at 1 Samuel 18, verse 1. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him. He gave it to David, his garments, even to his sword, and to his bow, and to his uh, girdle. 
And it says, and David went out with us, ever Saul sent him, behaved himself wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war. He was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's service. We also preached the message, and we talked about how he got the love. And we saw that in this passage in verses 1 through 4, and Jonathan's love for David was a picture of our love for Jesus Christ, that we should have a love that surrenders all. But to get back to our story and this friendship of Jonathan and David, understand that all of a sudden David is now a national hero. And what, one morning he gets up and he's just a shepherd boy. By the end of the day, he is a national hero. And his victory over Goliath and knocking, taking him out with a, with a slingshot and then pulling Goliath's own sword out and cutting his head off and holding that bloody thing up. And then the, the Israelite army rounding him conquering the Philistines that day, the news of what David did spread, one man said, like a Texas prairie fire. Everybody knew what David had done. Uh, if, if ticker tape had existed then, David probably would have had a ticker tape parade the next day. People knew that without David, without David killing the lion, the people knew that they would have suffered shame and they would have suffered defeat in the hands of the Philistines. Jonathan the son of King Saul realized that there was something very special about this young man named David. There was something different about him compared to all the other young men that Jonathan knew. He realized that David was a young man that dared to live by faith. Now think about this. And this is something that Jonathan had to deal with himself. When Goliath was taunting the army every day, Jonathan was there. Amen. Okay, Jonathan, Saul was there, Jonathan was there, the army was there. Now, Jonathan was a man of faith, he was a mighty warrior, we saw that in chapter 14, but on this occasion, Jonathan drew back. You might say Jonathan shrunk back, and he didn't exercise faith. He didn't say, listen, God, take care of this giant, and I'm going to do it. And so he sees something in David that he saw lacking in himself. He saw something, he saw a faith in David that even he himself did not have. And God moved mightily in Jonathan's heart, and the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. Now that word knit means chained or knitted like a rope. It means to be intertwined together, and their souls were knit together like soul brothers. Jonathan, the Bible says, also loved David. Jonathan was a friend that was closer than a brother to David. We use the verse Proverbs 18, 24. The man that had friends but show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Uh, this friendship was unique. Uh, Arno Gabelin states that Jonathan was about 40 years old at this time, and David was around 19 or 20. And the Lord calls David to be favored in Jonathan's eyes. Now, this is not a one-time thing. God has done this in, in the lives of other people. In Genesis 39, in verse 21, he did it for Joseph in the prison. When Potiphar met Joseph in prison, hey, who, who took a liking to him? The keeper of the prison, the captain of the prison, took a liking to Joseph. In Exodus 3, in verse 21, uh, he did it for the Israelites in Egypt and, 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 and taking care of them. In Esther chapter 5, uh, he did it for Esther in the eyes of the king. And listen, if God did it for them and God did it for David, listen, God can do it for you. God can do the same thing for you at home, the same thing for you at school, and the same thing for you at work. God enables David to have a friend. Listen, it's in the same household of a soon-to-be enemy, King Saul. This friendship would exist right under Saul's nose, and Jonathan would be a loyal friend to David. Now, it's interesting, talking to the teenagers, this was a point that I didn't hit before, but I want you to understand tonight. You cannot choose. You cannot choose who your loyal friends will be. Now, you may think so-and-so will be a loyal friend, but you won't know until the trial comes. You won't know until the testing comes. So you cannot choose who your loyal friends would be. Others determine if they're going to be loyal to you. You can, however, choose, you can choose to be a loyal friend. Amen. You can choose to be a loyal friend, or you can choose not to have a friend, one way or the other. So what does it mean to be a loyal, true friend? I put down here, first thing, is that friends are unselfish and sacrificial. We see in this passage that Jonathan stripped himself of his robe, his sword, his bow, and his girdle, and gave it to David. He gave David everything. His attitude is the same attitude that John the Baptist had when Jesus Christ came on the scene. John the Baptist said in reference to Christ, He must increase, and I must decrease. John chapter 3. 
Jonathan's princely robe was a symbol of royalty and authority in Israel. Prince Jonathan was, in essence, honoring David by giving David his robe. In fact, he was transferring his status as heir to the throne. He was giving that to David. See, Jonathan knew that David should be the next king, and he was not afraid to acknowledge this. Look in 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel 23. And look at verse 17. 1 Samuel 23, look at in verse 17. Jonathan is speaking here to David. Look what he says to him in verse 17. 1 Samuel 23, verse 17. This is Jonathan speaking. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find thee. And thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. And that also saw my father. No, isn't that an amazing thing how Jonathan, who was older, who should have been the next king, he said, listen, you, you're going to be all right because you're going to be the next king of Israel and I'm going to be right beside you. Wow. That's an amazing thing. That's, that's a loyal, true friend. Amen. And so Jonathan gives David his, his bow, his girdle, his, his stuff there, and David accepts it. Uh, by doing that, that was simply an act of obedience, love, and devotion to the will of God. David was to be the next king, not Jonathan. And amazing, as we said before, there was no rivalry, there was no jealousy in Jonathan, just love for David. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 6, Charity suffereth long and is kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. And the truth was dead was to be king. And Jonathan rejoiced in that truth. Number two, friends are trustworthy and loyal when they're absent from one another. And no matter who's around. These two gentlemen made a covenant which committed them to one another. And the gifts sealed the covenant between them. Listen, true friends do not tear each other up. True friends do not tear each other down. True friends don't gossip about one another. True friend, I, I doesn't talk about the one friend when he is not around. They don't say, I love you, and then try to destroy you behind your back. Listen, that is the epitome, the epitome of hypocrisy. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Third, friends strengthen and encourage one another especially in their walk with the Lord. Now, we hit that point pretty hard in the first message, but I wanted to hit it again. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Listen, both of these men were men of faith. Jonathan was a man of faith. David was a man of faith. And David had a positive effect on those around him. Now, let me ask you a question. Are the people around you, are others encouraged are drawn to the Lord because of you. I don't, I don't answer that one. Just ask the question to yourself. Are others encouraged or drawn to the Lord because of you? And if they be honest, yes or no? Yes, great. No, why not? Ask another question. Do you have a calming presence or soothing influence in the lives of others? Or when you show up, does everybody start freaking out? Or when you show up and people start getting nervous and start looking for reasons to leave and trying to avoid you. Do you have a calming presence? A soothing presence? Number four, friends are sensitive to one another's needs. Listen, friends don't belittle each other. They don't act rude to each other. They're not snooty, cold, or avoid you when other people are around. Amen. Hey, even when a friend maybe begins to date someone or they get engaged, they're still going to continue to reach out to their friends and involve them in his or her life. He will not or they will not shut them out like so many people do. This whole mentality, you see, especially, we say the high school level, but you, I, I see it in adulthood too. You're my one and only friend. You're the only friend I can ever have. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but I, I got time for more than one friend. I'm not going to let you monopolize me. Amen. Hello out there. There's a lot of people like that. That's the way it is in high school, right? You're my friend. I saw you talking to them. What are you talking for? <laughs> Boys and girls dating. There's a good one. Don't ever look at those girls again. I'll scratch your eyes out. Well, I, 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 we, we're in the same building. I don't care. That's only for me. Or I'm going to have your eyes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, 
that that's uh, it can't be that it's not friend that's not being a friend friends are loyal number five friends are loyal in difficult times difficult times hey Jonathan cared for David when Saul tried to kill him listen Saul was Jonathan's dad and we know that Saul what was certified in that case he already tried to kill Jonathan in chapter 14 no doubt he might probably want to kill Michael when she helped David but even in difficult times, Jonathan stuck by and helped David. And sad to say, Jonathan died in battle with his father. But, uh, but David cared for Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, in the royal palace in 2 Samuel chapter 21. He said, there's nothing I can do for Jonathan, but is there anybody in Jonathan's family left? He said, yeah, Jonathan had a son, Mephibosheth. And he said, bring him here. And he brought him in and he put him at the king's table and took care of him. And he was a young man who was crippled in his feet, but David cared for Jonathan's son. Number six, this is something I didn't really touch on in the previous message, but this is very important. Friends communicate. Friends communicate. Uh, friends privately work or talk out any problems that might arise. Amen. They do not Facebook their problems. Okay? We do not air out our issues on social media. That is called immaturity. Amen. Amen. <laughs> that is not what social media is for. Friends privately get together and talk or work out their issues. Say, so why would they do that? Because true friends love each other and care for each other. And listen, a lot, of, a lot of times problems that arise in friendship, a lot of times it's just a simple misunderstanding. It really is just a misunderstanding that can be easily resolved and cleared up. But if you just start airing all your laundry on social media, you're never going to clear that thing up. You're never going to clear it up. Listen, friends don't run away in anger, severing a friendship. Now, let me give it a little church application. You may hear people say something like this. I don't, I, I don't go to that church anymore because I just get nothing out of it. Well, see, there's the problem. I, me, <laughs> now, here's a new thought for you. You are to be putting yourself into the church. And you are to be putting yourself into the lives of other people. See, we're all this, we're this, and this, and this mentality of consume, consume, it's me, it's me, it's me. How about showing up at church and putting some of you in, in, and in? How about you investing in the lives of some other people? Some people say, well, that church doesn't meet my need. Well, why don't you go to church and meet the need of someone else? Amen. Some people say, I just don't have any friends. The Bible says you better be friendly if you want to have friends. You have to be friendly. You have to communicate with people. Get out of your shell. Pull your head out of the sand. And talk and communicate with people. So what kind of friend are you to others? Are you loyal? Are you dependable? Or are you fickle? Do you know the friend that's sitting close to the brother? Do you know who that friend is? That's Jesus Christ. <laughs> Listen, when you stay alive with Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was unselfish. Jesus Christ was sacrificial. And what's all said and done, he gave his life for us. He laid down his life for us. Hey, Jesus Christ is trustworthy and loyal. Hey, even though he's not, he's absent, you could say. He lives within us. Even though he's absent, listen, what does he do? He still intercedes for us. How about that? He's still there for us in our time of need. And guess what? And he is coming again, coming again to get us. And to take us home. Hey, Jesus Christ strengthens and he encourages us by his spirit. Ephesians 3.16 says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's what our friend Jesus Christ does for us. All the things that I just talked about in the previous message and these six things I just gave you, Jesus Christ does all of those things. Hey, Jesus Christ is sensitive to our needs. Philippians 4, 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. By who? Christ Jesus. Listen, he is sensitive to our needs. And, we, and listen, you may want to try to have a, a pity party tonight, but when it's all said and done, the Lord has met your needs. Amen. 
we just have to live in America where we're spoiled rotten. And we get our eyes on all the ones, and we forget that the needs are met. There you are watching TV, watching a movie, watching a show, wish I had that, I wish I had that, I wish I had that. <laughs> Excuse me, you have a TV. That means you're paying for power, and you're probably paying for cable, and you've got the TV, and you're sitting on something while you're watching that. Your needs are met plus some. Amen. But we wind up what we don't have, and we've got more than we know what to do with. Look around on Koi. What's booming in Koi? Storage buildings. I know, are they going to build a hotel? No, that's another U-Haul store. <laughs> people just go and store their stuff and pay people to take care of it, and they go and visit every now and then. Oh, yeah, I, I forgot I had that. Yeah. Here's another hundred. We'll be back next month. Hey, the Lord meets our needs. Hey, Jesus Christ is the boy. In difficult times. John 16, 33 said, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Listen, Jesus Christ is loyal to you and I in difficult times. And then Jesus Christ communicates with us through his spirit. Romans 8, 16. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are. We are the children. John 14, 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Communicate. Jesus Christ communicates to us through his Spirit. Now let's move down to verse 5. I read verse 5. That's friendship. It's some extra things on friendship. But also I want you to see not only the friendship, but I want you to see the favor tonight. The favor. Verse 5 again. It says, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war. He was accepted in the sight of all people, all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. One of the things that you and I need to understand about David is that David had an obedient attitude. He had an obedient attitude. Wherever the king sent him, David went. When his dad sent him to the army to get a report, David went. David had an obedient attitude. He went when the king sent him. And listen, there's something we can learn from David. We are to do the same. We're to go when the king of kings, our Savior, Jesus Christ, sends us and leads us. That's where we're to go. The Bible says that he behaved himself wisely, which means uh, successfully with prosperity and understanding. David was a man after God's own heart and God's word, and the result was success. Now, I'm working on, on some messages on David, and I'll give you a little forethought, and you can think about it. We know that the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart, right? Yes, that's what the Bible said. God said, when the next king, I'm looking for a man who's after my own. David was a man for God's own heart. But yet, here's an amazing thought. As you study David's life, David made a lot of life. I mean, that's what I'm working on. He blew it here, and he blew it here. That was a bad decision, and that was a bad decision. And we know about sheep was a bad decision. He counted and numbered, and he did, and you just go through. But the Bible did not say that David was a perfect man. The Bible said that David was a man for God's own heart. And when any of you study that, what you see is, again, David made a lot of mistakes, but I tell you what David always had a desire to do. Glorify God. He loved God. He glorified God. And when he made a mistake, you know what he did? He repented and kept going. Because David truly, David wasn't perfect, but David's desire, listen, his desire was for God. What is your desire tonight? I, I'm not asking you. I've never asked you. God hasn't asked you to be perfect. But God sure has asked you, what is your heart's desire? Amen. Hey, we're going to stumble and fumble. We're going to make mistakes. And when we get up, our eyes are on Christ. Our desire is Christ. Hey, we love the Lord. And we keep moving forward. Hey, David said, hey, I'm going to build, I'm going to build God a temple. And God said, no, no, no. Appreciate the thought with your son. But David wanted to. He wanted to. He, he loved, he loved the Lord. But he sought after God's own heart. He sought after God's word. The Bible says in Joshua 1 and verse 8, the book of the law, <coughs> this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou may uh, serve to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. It is amazing how many saved people try to live the Christian life without putting the word of God in. 
Never going to happen. You have to put the Word of God in you. You have to read the Word of God. I'm not cracking the whip. I'm not telling you how much. I'm just saying that you need to open up the Bible and be reading it. You put it in if you want to be have good success in your Christian life. Amen. It's just like kids in high school. They have we have we have the grammar part and you have the literature part. In literature, you have to read. And you read because you know. Even though you don't want to read, but you're going to read because you know there's going to be something called pop business. Right? Now, there's nothing worse than getting to class and teacher said, all right, now it's time for a pop quiz. And I've seen them do it. They sit there, they put their name, they number the paper, and listen in. You're asking the question. <laughs> They're trying to draw up an answer that does not exist in their brain. Because <laughs> they never put the, the word, the literature in. And then they miss all five. Like, oh, man. Oh, man. Now, did you read? No. Would you go through all the Germanic You just put zero up top. <laughs> and we laugh at that. But then here, here we come with the trials that come in our life. The unexpected things that come in our life. And then we try. We don't have anything to work from because we haven't been putting the Word of God in. It's kind of hard to fall back on the promises of God's Word if you're not reading God's Word. You can't fall back on the promises of God's Word if you don't know what the promises are. I know there's promises in there, but they're not really important enough for me to go look for them. So then you can't claim them, you can't use them, you can't stand upon them. We talked about the other night, hey, hey, when the waves come crashing in, your house is going down because you, you haven't built a foundation. You have to be in the Word of God if you want to have. Listen, when I say good success, I, I did not say you're a millionaire. I didn't say you're going to live in a house work. I didn't say you're going to have four cars, a four car garage. It says you're going to have good success, and that is success defined through the eyes of God. Amen. So we find in that verse that Saul promotes David. Uh, he's a big wig in the army. He's linked the men in and out to battle. And what the Lord is doing is God is equipping and he's preparing David for the future. Hey, the people of the nation, even though he's a young man, hey, they, they appreciate what he has done. They admire his faith and they take him in and they follow him. The Bible says in Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Listen, everything that's taking place in David's life is preparing him for something down the road. And everything that takes place in your life and mine is God preparing us for things down the road. Amen. You know, I, I, I graduated from UCF. I started off in accounting. Because I was going to, listen, I'm just being honest. I'm going to be rich. And accountants make good money. That's what I was told. And so I started off in accounting. I blew through accounting in high school. It was really easy. Took accounting one, took accounting two, then I, then I took accounting three at college. I said, ooh, there's a lot of numbers going here and there, and I don't really care about that. <laughs> so then I changed majors to business, business management. And I started taking business, business management classes. And then I was working in a business, and I went from part-time warehouse to full-time warehouse to warehouse manager. And then I moved inside to warehouse and parts manager, and eventually became the office manager. And the whole time I'm working in this business, and I'm taking these classes, and I'm thinking, these classes have nothing to do with the real world. I'm in the real world. I'm balancing the books. I'm doing the, I'm chasing the accounts. I'm doing all this stuff. We're having the sales meeting. We're selling stuff. And then I go to school, and I feel like I was in La La Land. And then the, the thing I hate the worst about business class is I always want to put this in a group. Now, you five work on this. You guarantee out of five on two on going to work. That three are lazy bums. But you've got, to, you've got to get the job done because you can't go and say, hey, those three are bums. That doesn't matter. You want the grade? you got to pick up the slack. So anyway, I got out of that. And I went to political science and history. I'm going to be a lawyer. Still going to be what? I'm still going to be rich. And so I got through and I got my political science degree and then you know the rest. I started teaching school and here I am today. He said, what's the point of that whole story? Well, the point of the whole story is this. Well, you just wasted your years in college. No, because when I, when I came to victory, guess what came into account? Accounting, business management, 
teaching school. I mean, all those, every, every little snippet I got here and there, and every little experience I got working at this company and doing this, and all that was God equipping me, even though I was a knucklehead, and I was running over here, and I was running over there. The Lord knew, hey, I'm going to bring you right here. Right. And all those experiences came into play when I came to victory. And it was one of the first things I had to do when I came and took over the school. First thing I had to do, we had to get the school right, we had to get the school out of the red into the black. And thank God we've been in the black ever since. But we had to get the accounting straight. And that man meant figuring out what tuition needed to be and what needed to charge for books and get that squared away. So we were ahead every year, not behind. And so all the things that I had done a little here and a little there and kind of thought, well, I wasted my time. No, all that came to play down the road. And it's the same in the life of David and it's the same in your life. God can, God can take the experiences you're going through that you have gone through, whether it was something little or something big, and bring it all together in the end in your life. Number three, I want you to see, we saw favor, but I want you to see festivity. Festivity will be done. Look at verses six and seven. And it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing, meeting King Saul with tabrets and with joy and with instruments of music. The women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands. And Saul said, That's right. That's right. I've slain my thousands. And then the rest of the song came. And David his ten thousands. Hey, what? What did they sing? What song were they singing? Who wrote that stupid song? Boy, now he's not so happy. But, the, but the, there's festivity here because of the people. I want to give you one more note here. Let's go back to verse 6. I don't know why I'm going to say this, but I'm going to say it. Singing and dancing. It says that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing. Very interesting. If you do a study on, on dancing in the Bible, guess what you're going to find? They're dancing. But you know, because that's what every teenager said. Well, I'm dancing the Bible. Women were dancing. David danced before the ark, but if you study every occasion where dancing comes up, guess what you're going to find? It's women dancing women. Or it's a man dancing men. There's no mixed dancing in the Bible. On every occasion that there is dancing, you'll study it. It's women with women, it's the men with the men. Now listen, if you're married, you can dance with your wife all you want, amen? You do whatever, that's your wife. That's your wife. But all this other garbage we got going on, not in your Bible. You when your little smart eyed kid says, Well, the Bible says, say, you know what, son? Why don't you go find out? I want you to show me everything the Bible says about dancing. When they run every reference and they bring it to you, and you would come, you would not say, Yep, yeah, women were dancing. Yep, yeah, women were dancing. Yep, yeah, women were dancing. Oh, yep, yeah, men were dancing. I never find where the twain go together. Amen. Uh, that helped you out, amen. I just want to throw that out there for you. That's free. Let's get back to the festivity. <laughs> amen. So upon his return for victory, the women uh, of all the cities, they come out. They're celebrating. They're singing this song. And uh, it was a time of great joy. And a matter of fact, another interesting thing, this is the first time the word joy shows up in your Bible. Another interesting fact. Uh, notice their praise. Well, here's something that's very interesting. We saw the psalm. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Notice that nobody, just to show you the spiritual state of Israel, no one was praising God. God's the one that gave the victory. Hey, God's the one that caused that stone to hit that giant forehead and bring him down. The Bible says in Psalm 10, verse 4, the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not see after God. God is not in all his thoughts. They should have been singing praises to God for what he did. But they were singing the praise of men. Now, as I mentioned, the first part of the song was great to Saul. He thought it was outstanding. But the second part of the song put him in the orbit. He just went over the top. But what we see is that the people are simply grateful for David's leadership. Hey, because of David, listen, husbands are safer. Hey, because of David, brothers are safer. Hey, because of David, sons are safer. Hey, we're not going out and dying in battle. The song implies that David was ten times more effective than Saul. And that didn't sit well with the proud king. Even the Philistines knew of this song. Look at 1 Samuel 21. I mean, this, this song 
hit the top top 40, amen? Look at 1 Samuel 21. It's played on all the stations in there. Psalm 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 21, look at verse 11. It says in verse 10, And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul, and he went to Achish, the king of Gath. This is the Philistines. And look what it says in verse 11. And the servants of Achish, okay, that's the king of Gath, and the land of the Philistines, said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? This is a popular song. You can also put down 1 Samuel 29, verse 5. It's brought up again. Now, here's what's very interesting. Day, psalm 23 that David wrote uh, in that psalm, and some of the kids have been learning that psalm in Sunday school, but in, in 1 Samuel, I mean, in Psalm 23, David talks about uh, walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, David's about to enter that journey. He's about to walk through the valley of the shadow of death because Saul's trying to kill him. Whenever David goes, he's on the run. When Saul shows up, he has to run again. So listen, dealing with success, and that's what he's dealing with here, can be just as difficult as dealing with defeat as David's about to find out. You would think that, hey, David's, David's on the mountaintop. David's killed the giant. Hey, the people are singing praises to his song. This is great, but no, it's about to get tough. David's very familiar with the dangers of pride because he saw it in the life of King Saul. David wrote in Psalm 18, 27, For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but wilt bring down high looks. God brought down Saul eventually. David knew you handle success. And this is good for all of us. How do you handle success? David knew you handle success by pointing to the Lord. Listen. And honoring Him. Hey, anything good I've done, anything good you do is because of Him. David said, hey, I'm not going to let my head get big. I'm going to keep pointing and honoring the Lord. Corey Ten Boom uh, wrote a book, was a, a speaker, and she said this, Corey Ten Boom was, was praised frequently after she spoke to crowds. And what kept her from getting a big head? What kept her from becoming so proud of her accomplishments and her speaking skills and sharing her story? They said that she kept from getting proud by imagining that every compliment that was given to her that she, she took, she imagined the compliments as flowers, and she would take each individual compliment as a flower, and she would make a bouquet. And then each night when she got home, she would take that bouquet, and she would give it to the Lord and go to sleep. Because her heart was for the Lord. And she knew that all those compliments were because of Him. And she would, in her imagination, take those, and she would present that bouquet to the Lord every night. See, the challenge for us tonight as we close, the challenge for us tonight as we saw with Jonathan and David, our challenge is to be knit, intertwined, is to be knit to the Lord and to love Him here. Just like Jonathan and David did. Is to be intertwined, be knit with the Lord, and to love Him dearly. It's sad to say some of us love other things <coughs> dearly than we do. Lord. God help us tonight to be available to the Lord. Listen, and to make Him our soulmate. That makes all the difference in our lives. That walk we have with Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for time tonight. I know we revisited some thoughts from the previous message and added some and then been through some other things, but I pray you led us tonight. I pray for the beneficial and helpful to us. Heads bowed, eyes closed, maybe here tonight and say, Master God.